Thank you. Thank you, Nancy Wu, and uh, thanks to Barbara Baim for curating this beautiful exhibition, Choirs of Angels, painting in Italian choir books, 1300 to 1500. I will be assisted today by my own Choir of Angels, students from Manus, the New School for Music, also known as the Manus College of Music here in Manhattan. They are Alyssa Goldstein, Chelsea Delgado, <laughs> Shannon Calandrillo, Sofia Dimitrova, Liebheim, and Boris Haimov. Please welcome the, the Manus Scola. As for what I have to say, it's all in the title. By sounding illuminations, I mean for you to consider the musical sounds noted in the pages of Italian choir books, the living sounds that those pages call forth from our bodies as illuminations of the text we sing. And when I say the music of the manuscripts, I mean not only the sounding of those songs and chants, not only their musical notation, to which I'm going to introduce you, but also the visual music of the pages themselves. Finally, I will ask you to consider these pages as individual notes, if you will, in the long-term and large-scale music of the daily, weekly, and annual round of ceremony for which they are made and in which they perform a vital function. Here's a photograph of a 15th century choir book page that you'll find in the exhibition. On its parchment surface, we find Latin text written in Gothic script in black ink with a broad nibbed pen. Above the text, we find its musical setting noted in rectangular shapes, what we call square note notation, moving up and down over a four-line staff ruled in red. At the upper left of the image, we find the element that especially draws the attention of art collectors, a masterful painted initial, this one featuring the gold leaf whose radiance is perhaps the source of the term illumination for just this kind of painting. This particular initial is the capital G that begins the text of the antiphon Gloria Tibi Trinitas, which is sung on Trinity Sunday, eight weeks after Easter. Now this antiphon and the liturgy it comes from are in honor of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God in three persons, a mystery in Catholic doctrine that is beyond uh, beyond words. But it's not beyond the power of the painter to illuminate. Here, the gray-bearded father, wearing the high crown of the church's earthly father, the pope, supports with outstretched arms the cross on which similarly, similarly are outstretched the arms of the son. And Above the crucified's head is a, a dove descending, its wings outstretched. You'll see a better picture, a closer picture of it soon. Uh, the wings are outstretched in descent, recalling the scene of Christ's baptism in the Gospel of Matthew. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son. So the painter presents three distinct figures, as the doctrine teaches, there are three distinct persons. But with each stretching himself open on the horizontal plane, and all three aligned on the vertical plane, the painter also creates a harmony, that is, a larger unity from disparate elements a visual harmony that illuminates the mysterious unity the Antiphon's text speaks to. For that reason and many others, the page is beautiful to look at, but just listen to how it sounds.
This audible harmony is Gregorian chant, the music of the Roman Catholic liturgy from the Middle Ages and the official music of its ceremonies even today. More honored in the breach than the observance perhaps, but still the official music. The term Gregorian honors Saint Gregory the Great, under whose papacy at the turn of the seventh century, existing chants were codified and some new ones composed. Not that Gregory himself in his earthly life would have recognized this particular antiphon as no liturgy specifically dedicated to the Trinity was composed until the 10th century, long after his death. But Gregory would no doubt recognize the style of the music and its purpose, a sacrifice of praise and an exercise in spiritual harmony through the lifting of voices in unity. Now, when we hear Gregorian chant these days, it's often in men's voices, either those of monks or professional groups like, I don't know, Lionheart, for example. <laughs> so at this point, you might ask, did women in the Middle Ages really ever sing this music? And, uh, and the answer is, well, of course they did, especially in the convents. Uh, where the nuns had the same work of daily worship to do as did their brother monks, and they still do today. A major portion of the duties of any monastic, male or female, was the chanting of the entire Psalter, that is, all 150 psalms, over the course of each week. This image from the illuminated Psalter of the young King Henry VI of England shows a community of nuns in choir, each chanting from her own breviary, the book of texts for the monastic services in which that weekly Psalter was chanted communally. The office hours include, for example, lauds at dawn, uh, known at the ninth hour, which is where we get our English word noon, and vespers in the evening, and the night hour of vigils, sometimes called matins, chanted in the pre-dawn darkness. These nuns from 21st century France are chanting Vespers from a modern edition of another book. I have it here. It's called the Antiphonale in Latin or uh, in English, Antiphoner or Antiphonary. This book con contains the music as well as the words of the daylight hours. I'm very interested in what the sister on the left is doing in the front. You notice she's chanting along with her sisters, but uh, she's holding the book closed in front of her. Memory, memory plays a very large role in the church's ceremonies and in its books. The first task of the monastic novice was to memorize the entire Psalter in Latin. This may seem daunting to us now that we don't even memorize phone numbers. But with daily practice and due diligence, the project of learning the Psalter by heart was usually completed well within the first year of joining the monastery. So the image of chanting nuns in Henry's Psalter would remind him of the piety and diligence of the subjects who at all hours of the day and night were praying for, among other things, his personal health and salvation. And perhaps it also acted as a goad to uh, piety and diligence in his own studies. 